Um, without a doubt, uh, the highlight of the year was our uh, brand new boardwalk. Um, there we go. <laughs> um, I've spoken about this boardwalk on many occasions. It was just truly uh, one of the most exciting things. Um, since we learned that we got the grant um, up until the uh, ribbon cutting ceremony held in April, it truly has been a labor of love for everyone involved. Um, it's an homage to our founders who 30 years ago uh, cared so deeply about this disappearing habitat and worked tirelessly to preserve it and bring it to the attention of others so that they too would come to care for it and help protect it. It's an honor and a privilege to carry on their legacy. Um, while it's really great to have a brand new boardwalk, the positive impact of this project on the community is also really great. Uh, with this project, we were able to build uh, to improve infrastructure at the Soy Center Center, which has created a higher quality tourism product. We were able to increase accessibility, um, meeting the needs of those with varying abilities and um, ages, as well as uh, create new job opportunities. Economic stimulus was a key to this grant, and I'm proud to say that we accomplished that goal. Working on the boardwalk project this past winter allowed our contractor, local uh, landscaping company C3 Industries that won the bid uh, for the project to keep its crews employed throughout the winter season and also hire several temporary workers. C3 was also able to invest revenue from the boardwalk trail project back into the community in the form of much needed housing. With revenue from the boardwalk contract, C3 built a three bedroom suite uh, above its shop that is now used uh, as staff accommodations. Uh, so these employees would not have been able to work with C3 in our community without having access to those accommodations. Um, so one of the uh, greatest outcomes of the project um, was also the pride that the C3 crew had uh, working on the boardwalk build. Trish and Martin Han, uh, owners of C3, told me um, about this project, quote, the relationship bonds that were formed between this group of mostly young people was incredible. To have invested so much sweat, intention, and camaraderie in a community building project has had a lasting impact on everyone involved. No doubt there will be crew members who in years to come take their children or and grandchildren to the boardwalk and proudly say, I helped build this. To have been involved in a project of this scale and to have learned so much about the ecological uniqueness and preciousness of this region will have community benefits beyond anything quantifiable. Everyone who worked on the boardwalk project took home an extreme amount of community pride for working on such a significant and impactful town legacy. Um, unquote. After uh, construction uh, was completed, we were happy to celebrate with the crew and presented each of them with a certificate of appreciation. Um, even though the winter weather threw a couple of curveballs our way, uh, I think um, I'm pretty sure that the experience that they had, that they'll remember it fondly forever. Um, so I thought I oh, went too far. I think. Uh, there we go. I thought I would throw this in as well. This up here is kind of a fun look at some of the. Um, statistics, the boardwalk by the numbers. Um, uh, so yeah, just some really interesting <laughs> little tidbits there. Um, I don't know if any of you saw the helicopter flying out the um, sections of the old boardwalk, uh, but that was pretty incredible. If you haven't seen any of this stuff, you can go on our YouTube uh, page uh, and there is a, um, a video footage of the construction process from start to beginning or start to end rather it's, it's it's really interesting so again a big thanks have to go up to the people who contributed to this milestone achievement uh the province of bc for the financial support the associates desert center building committee peter beckett roger Horton, and trevor reeves c3 industries of course and the crew members uh larry stone who's here today um our incredible volunteer project manager and uh all the dedicated volunteers and the entire board and staff. Um, if you take a look at those last two sections, uh, two statistics, sorry, um, we certainly can't forget the community that helped us repurpose an incredible 98% of the old boardwalk. 
so that only 2% ended up going to the landfill in the end. So that was pretty exciting. Um, yeah, so a really, really a super, super exciting project for us. Uh, it's definitely this this season and, and people that came out to the uh, Desert Center this season were just blown away by it and just really loved it. And it's really awesome to have. So um, what I mentioned that we were able to reinstate um, much of our summer programming. So just to highlight a few events, um, we uh, had a uh, bee expert Lincoln Scout to do a talk on wild bees and their floral relationships, talking about pollination, how important it is. Uh, we worked uh, with the Metal Art Festival again, who uh, was uh, back up and running after a two year uh, hiatus for them as well. Um, we hosted a bird, For the Birds Bluebird Nest Box Building workshop. And uh, and um, we took part in the fall festival weekend, the amazing Oliver race. So we had teams come through the SOS desert center and give them four clues to look for along the boardwalk. And they had to identify those clues <clears throat> and then carry on on the race. And that was a lot of fun as well. Uh, we also had seven nature talks that took place throughout the summer, covering topics like understanding badgers, a bat talk, a talk on climate change given by our Conservation guy Larissa, who was just completing her master's degree on the effects of climate change on polar bears in northern Canada. And we also brought in a couple of guest speakers. We had Lauren Meads from the Burrowing Owl Conservation Society, as well as Lindsay Whitehead from the Incomeet Desert Cultural Center. She brought some snakes, so that's always a big, uh, a big thrill for people to, to come to the talk. Um, our early bird tours took place each Thursday throughout the summer. Folks would gather at 7 a.m. and have a walk around the boardwalk to see what critters were up and about at that time of day. And we resumed our, uh, resumed our night tours where participants went out on the boardwalk under the cover of darkness with a UV flashlight in hand to see what was out there. Uh, I, I know Pastor Bennett uh, joined us for one of those tours. It was, it was pretty fun, unfortunately. We didn't get to see the star of the show, which would have been a scorpion because their exoskeletons glow in the dark um, under the UV light. But unfortunately, we didn't see one this year, but maybe next year. Um, it was a very popular. We, we started out programming just two events and ended up having uh, to, to add another one just because it sold out instantly. People were really excited to, to get out there and have a look around. Um, in terms of research, we had the most uh, productive year in a while. Uh, just to name a few things, um, we had uh, <clears throat> our previous conservation guy, Andres and Sarah Brett, return to the SOS Desert Center in the capacity of his new job at the Summerland Agricultural Research Center to conduct uh, biocontrol agent surveys for invasive knapweed. Uh, we had um, we installed a modus antenna, it's called, to set up uh, 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 to detect and monitor Lewis's woodpeckers. Um, and we did that in conjunction with Canadian Wildlife Services. Um, and we also conducted bat auditory recordings via a passive bat detector um, that we were able to purchase with the help of Parks Canada. Um, and so we uh, we know that we've detected some bats out there. Um, during and this winter, we're gonna analyze the data at Lior is going to have to analyze the data that we are, or he's our resident biologist and the uh, desert center manager uh, to see what exactly uh, we have out there in, in, in terms of bats. And of course, we do lots of wildlife monitoring, as I mentioned, uh, we monitor the state foots, we monitor the bluebirds, we have 14 bluebird nest boxes around the site. And, and the bluebird story is actually one of the great uh, success stories of citizen science uh, since um, bluebird numbers, bluebird ha there, um, there's a lot of habitat loss for, for bluebird, bluebirds, and uh, with people building nest boxes, the bluebirds have actually, the population of the blue, bluebirds have bounced back significantly, so that's kind of an exciting uh, success story. Um, so that's just a cut mentioning a couple of the research program, uh, projects that we have uh, going on. Um, uh, we also, I mentioned that um, Education is, is really important to the SOS Desert Center. Fortis, BC has supported the school field trips for the center for many, many years. And in January 2020, we received a Fortis grant for our school programs, but because of COVID, we were not able to offer any programs for the year 2020 and 2021. 
So in 2022, we uh, were able to get it going again. We had some 462 elementary, middle uh, school, secondary school students from both school district 67 and school district 53, uh, as well as UBC students and home schools, schoolers who took part in complementary uh, school programs. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, our school programs are more than just a little fun stroll on the boardwalk. Um, the, they are immersive place-based educational programs tied directly to the BC curriculum outcomes. So um, they uh, are immersive. Uh, they touch on concepts like uh, big ideas from the curriculum, like ecosystem adaptation, energy pyramid, biodiversity, connectivity. Um, and this kind of place-based learning uh, has been shown in um, research to be extremely beneficial to, to young people. And the feedback that we get from school teachers and uh, students is incredible. Mm -hmm. uh, so we really hope that this grows uh, in the years to come. And the dream is to one day have a uh, purpose-built outdoor classroom at the uh, Soyuz Desert Center. That might be a few years down the road, but one never knows. Um, we are also the lead organization in a multi-year project that we are doing with Environment and Climate Change Canada, um, Habitat Conservation Trust Fund, and the South Okanagan Conservation Fund. It's an antelope brush conservation, uh, restoration, and management uh, project. Uh, and several of the students that were came out to the, the uh, Desert Center also went out um, under the auspices of this program and actually planted antelope brush on several sites, uh, the Nature Trust of uh, British Columbia site and also some private um, landowner sites. About 150 antelope brush seedlings were planted and watered over the course of the, um, the spring and summer and the programs are continuing this fall and also into the spring. It's a very popular, we're working with uh, partners on the project with uh, partners like Nature Trust of BC, the Okanagan and Smoking and Conservation, uh, Concert, sorry, Okanagan Smoking and Basin Species Society, uh, Okanagan Smoking and Stewardship, Penticton Museum, Anona Cafe, Penticton Indian Band Knowledge Keeper, um, and of course we we're involved. So so we really hope to expand that program in the years to come. Um, just to mention a couple of uh, uh, promotional highlights, uh, we have we had several local and regional media in. Uh, do stories on us. It's very, very supportive. We've got great support from Destination of Soyuz, who uh, sends bloggers our way uh, and they uh, write uh, stories on us. Uh, Global News, Travis Lowe uh, did a, was an eight part series uh, called Open Open Park Spaces and featured the Soyuz Desert Center on that show. And we've also had articles in uh, the Walrus, oh. Asparagus Magazine, and Vogue Magazine. And uh, that was really really kind of cool getting a mention in Vogue magazine. Uh, they were actually doing a story on um, uh, lesser known uh, winery regions around the world. But the last um, sent, couple sentences in the uh, article about the Okanagan Valley read, uh, quote, it's stunningly beautiful. So dedicate some time to enjoy the outdoors, whether that's hiking, bicycling, or kayaking on Lake Okanagan. At the southern end of the lake, walk the boardwalk at the Soyuz Desert Center to experience the unique landscape of Canada's only desert, unquote. So that's pretty cool to get a mention in Vogue magazine. Looking forward, uh, we're, we're raising money for a pergola. We definitely, desperately need it uh, in our big open space to be able to uh, protect ourselves from the sun and wind uh, and whatever. Um, the, the uh, weather wants to throw at us uh, so that we can also expand our season uh, into the shoulder season and offer programming um, would, would give us um, uh, a cover for that as well. Um, we, we're working on a site development development plan, as I mentioned, future goals uh, to have a purpose-built outdoor classroom and, uh, and further programming expansion as well as mentioned whole uh, events of the shoulder season. And we're also looking to improve our infrastructure. Uh, right now, further improve our infra infrastructure. Right now we, have, we are solar operated, which is great, completely run on solar, but we don't have year round, year -round uh, water out of the desert center. So it's difficult for us uh, to hold any events in the, in, once it freezes, because we won't have any washing facilities. So we'd like to perhaps look into what we can do to get water 
Uh, so we're just sort of starting our investigation there. So um, financially speaking, uh, we're we're looking good. We're we're very positive. We're cautious, of course, never knowing what the what's to come. Um, but uh, certainly, our core funders uh, play a critical role in uh, providing stability for our organization. The uh, you, the town of the Soyuz, the REOS, and the province of BC provide operational funding, which is not often funded by many um, funders. And so, it is critical funding for us. And and uh, on behalf of the board of directors uh, and Leo Oren, uh, myself. Um, We'd like to say thank you very much to the town. Um, your uh, support allows us to provide opportunity of, uh, employment opportunities in our community. It allows us to continue to promote the Soyuz as a vibrant tourism destination. Uh, it allows us to offer community programming and events related <laughs> to our quality of life, uh, help pay for our core operating expenses, as I mentioned, not covered by their funders, and it makes a big difference in what the center has and will continue to accomplish. So thank you very much. Um, as we look to the future, we're hopeful um, and excited about what's to come. And I did um, want to also introduce you to, I should have done this at the top of um, my presentation, our treasurer here is here, our new treasurer, Angela Hapsom. And I know that uh, you received our financial statements from 2021. So if you have any questions about anything that we do or any questions about uh, our finances, then please feel free. Thank you very much for Thank presenting. You. That's a, a great overview. Um, and I'm uh, just two things. I remember, I think it was about a year ago when you came to council, and I think it was Larry that spoke and said it's going to cost us two hundred and fifty thousand dollars to get rid of the old boardwalk. And um, we were all stunned. And I'm just amazed that you have handled that so well. Um, repurposing 98% of it. That is, that's phenomenal. So thinking carefully about how things can get done and, you know, uh, coming up with great answers. The other, the only other thing I wanted to ask was do, you've sometimes done educational programs during the winter. Sometimes they've been at um, that watermark. Yes. I'm just wondering if that is in the works or, yeah. oh, yes. It is, absolutely, yes. We'll look forward yeah. to that. Yeah. So uh, we have five presentations today, so we're going to be quick, but Councillor King, yeah, did you have a question? A great presentation. Mm -hmm. Glad to hear your attendance. So just one of the things, have you heard of economic uh, trust of the Southern Interior? They get grants out twice a year, up to 100000 Okay. No. They used to be called CIDIC. I believe the mayor sits on that committee. Okay. That's EDC. Okay. Yes. I can give you some information That's on that. Happy with and, um, Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Economic trust. On the southern interior. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you very much, Jamie. Thank we you. appreciate you coming and your enthusiasm for everything that goes on out there. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Valerie. Okay. Um, the the next presentation is from the Atuis and District Museum. Um, and it was being presented by Martha Collins, who's the president, and Kara Burton, the executive director. Would you like to come up, please? Mayor, Council, staff, thanks for inviting us today to give you an update about what's happening at the museum. And I think a lot of the sentiment that we wanted to present to you today is very similar to what Jamie presented uh, concerning the Desert Center, that we are all working very hard in our organizations to provide a better service for the town, to make sure that we move forward, to make sure that we take into consideration all activities all, to make sure that it's accessible for all people to come and see us. But most importantly, as far as museums are concerned in the world right now, we are living in a very tenuous position and we cannot forget our history. If we forget our history, we will be in very big trouble. And the history that we have at the museum is the history of pioneers that came here and developed the town and brought their families and invested and created a future for all of us. And so while we are dealing mostly with history, we're also looking at moving forward and how we can provide 
a better service, and a better community asset. Over the last few years, with the expert help of Mr. Larry Stone, our project manager, we've taken an old rundown home building center and turned it into a showcase building. So when you come to the museum and you walk in, everything that you see is brand new. And except for the artifacts. <laughs> <laughs> That's my museum joke. I use it all the time. Anyway, everything that you see is new. And um, we are coming towards the end of the renovation of the interior of the building. And this is why I'm dressed like this today. Today will be our last cleanup day of drywall and all of the things in the basement that have to go because the taper is coming in the next few days to finish off the project in the basement. Larry will give you an update on that. Kara will talk about programming. But I also wanted to thank you, as Jamie did, so very much for how critical your funding is towards the operations of the museum. So on behalf of the board of the Sudius Museum Society, we have Leslie Anderson. She's our secretary. Larry Stone is our project manager. And we didn't see if anybody else came in. Anyway, thank you for your attention. I'm going to turn the turn the presentation over to Kara, and then you'll hear from Larry. And we're quite excited, if you haven't seen it yet, the big giant backhoe that's parked in the empty <laughs> lot. So over to Kara. Thank you, Kara. Um, so I know you've almost all been into the new building. We've had quite a few events recently, which have been going great. We posted last week alone. Um, two events, which is what we're getting into a little bit more. We have the Chamber of Commerce event as well as our own fundraising event on Friday night, which increases our numbers, but it also gives the community an idea of where we're moving and what we have in that building, what we can accommodate. Specifically, <coughs> we have an exhibit in from called Waterways. It's a, a collaborative exhibit that was created by the Tony Museum Society, as well as the Nelson Center, um, the Okanagan Basin Water Board, or Okanagan Water Basin Board. I always get that mixed up. Um, UBC Okanagan is quite a, an in, impressive exhibit. Um, you do need to spend some time there to really get immersed in it, but it's, it's primarily videos and people just talking about how water affects our communities, how it affects our valley, and the impact of water and the waterways locally. Um, we're also, as well as getting into our school visits and bringing the schools back in. Um, again, we got hit with COVID and the renovation and, and we have been on reduced hours and closed for the last couple of years. So we're getting back into all those types of visits. Our numbers have been increased incredibly. Um, the old building in a year, we would probably get about 2000 visitors, which is quite low, but we were pretty hidden down there and it wasn't the most inviting looking space uh, the building um now in the new space this summer alone we we've, we've tripled those numbers um and that wasn't even full-time hours this year so that's <clears throat> been great we are currently open um just on a donation basis so we're not charging admission yet we're it's a bit of a debate as to whether we'll go back to admission or stay on donation but currently we're actually um we've actually been bringing in more revenue just in donations, people giving into the donation box when they arrive as opposed to charging an admission fee. <clears throat> um, as far as I know, you're all itching to know about the old building. <laughs> we are moving out and we're quite excited about that. Um, as Martha said, the lower level is almost done in our new building, which we do need to have uh, to a certain degree so that we can move the last of our pieces in. Um, so we've got a community up crew, as Martha mentioned, coming in today to work on the lower level with, with the bin. And once they're finished today, the bin's moving down to the old building so that we can start really cleaning out and moving everything out of there. Um, so then whatever's going to happen to that building can happen. <laughs> um, so we're, we're pretty pleased. Um, as Martha said, the building is almost complete. We are now also moving into the outdoor space. So we're hoping that by next summer, um, the lower level will be complete as well as our outdoor space, which will be open partially to the public, but will also be an outdoor um, urban heritage park so that it can be used for outdoor education, primarily on agriculture and irrigation. And um, there'll be a few of our larger artifacts, um, orcharding equipment and, and whatnot 
on display outside. So that will be part of the museum visit. You'll be able to, to go into the outdoor space. The outdoor space will also be able to be used for um, small outdoor events um, when we have open houses and that type of thing. I don't have too much else to say, but if anyone does have any questions. Maybe you'd just like to mention the dates you're actually open. The we're, dates of the week you're open. currently open Tuesday through Friday from 10 till 3. Um, in the summertime, we were also open on Saturday, um, but now with the we're back down to Tuesday through Friday. We are there five days a week, so but it's kind of nice for myself and our other staff member to have a day when with no interruptions when we can actually get some other work done. Um, and then on from Tuesday through Friday, we welcome you. Yeah, thank you. I've had the pleasure of uh, being in your building. It's a great exhibit, and I'd really encourage anybody out there in the public to listen to take the time to look at the museum. Thank you. Are you going to tell us about the back hole in the outside? <laughs> that, that, that's that's one of the first steps for uh, getting that, that outdoor space done. Oh. We have to get out all the concrete. <laughs> <laughs> and then isn't it Tree Canada or Tree, we did get us a grant through Tree Canada from through Home through Francis at Home Home Studio from Harder. She's one of our huge supporters. Um, so a year ago, she applied to Tree Canada, and part of the Tree Canada um, association with with Home Hardware Canada is that the home hardware stores that get those grants have to provide the trees to the community. And so she was able to secure one of those grants, and so then she um, donated those trees. So not all trees, but trees and plantings that we we all um, she arranged through family greenhouses. So those will all be incorporated into the outdoor park. So that covers a, a portion of that as well. And the murals on the side? Yes. Is when it comes about that. <laughs> I, there's so many things. Like, yes. the, murals, the murals are all our title photos. And we chose those three because they do depict our three core themes of land, people, and industry. Um, so we wanted to create um, a similar feeling from the mural, the archival photos on Francis's building. So when you're coming down Main Street, there's Francis's building on one corner, um, and then the museum on the other corner. So it sort of ties it to the three buildings together there. But yeah, those those are quite impressive. We're quite pleased. We are just waiting to have them framed out, um, and then they'll be complete. And we have a fourth one that will be going on the other side of the building. Um, in the park. Thank you. Thank you very much, and, and Martha. We really appreciate um, the enthusiasm and everything like that, mm -hmm. that you guys do. And we've got lots of volunteers in this community, as is evidence in this room right now. And um, we certainly appreciate everything that you do. Thank you. Um, and I'm glad you're doing donations because that often is a much better way of getting, <laughs> of getting the money. Okay, thank you so much. And um, next we have the um, the airport, Studious Airport Society. And I see um, Glenn Harris is on, uh, on our video here. And we have uh, Rob Roach and Diane Thomas in the room. So welcome. Yes, unfortunately, Glenn, uh, excuse me, the last person to come to COVID. <laughs> we met on the plane. I was going to San Diego and Rob was going to Mexico. It was probably one of the things I was It was a little tough to be back. Yeah, good. Um, Thank you. And well, like, well, like all of you, I'm struck with this, yeah, the volunteerism is down to start down today, but not. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, I apologize to Councillors uh, Bennett and King and to you as well, Mayor McCordoff, that you're going to hear some of the same stuff you've heard over and over again. This is um, a lot of, for Councillors Chong and Puerto Rico to just bring up to speed with what's going on at the airport. Um, no pun intended, or 10,000 foot flyover with what's going on. Um, yeah, see a picture there of the airport back in uh, 2006, immediately following um, our first spend. Uh, it wasn't the Airport Development Society per se, that was actually DO under Glenn Mazia um, that got it paid. Airports tend to go through this evolution where they start out as a, you know, a, a dirt strip and a grass strip, some pavement, some apron, some hangers, some businesses. Um, they all look at the same timeline. It's not a short period of time. It's remarkable, actually, that, what is that? 16 years ago, 
Um, okay. That's actually pretty quick to get where we are now. It doesn't look like a lot's going on up there until the last year when all the new pavement showed up. Now it's very exciting um, to see some some activity. Uh, you go ahead one slide again. So like uh, the other groups are presented this morning, we're, we're comprised of a core group of volunteers. Uh, Glenn's on a Zoom call here. Uh, myself is uh, um, vice chair and uh, Diana Thomas is secretary and treasurer and several other people here comprised of members of the uh, Racing Society. Uh, JF is a property owner up there, obviously, and a couple of uh, local stakeholders, pilots. Um, that's how thank you. So, uh, our mandate, uh, just to remind you, is, um, work with the town, the RDOS, the OIB, DO, stakeholders in the community to uh, preserve and develop the airport, uh, primarily for that first word, they're safe, secure, and operational. Um, the most recent steps that we've taken have definitely made it more safe, and we hope uh, we'll serve to make it more operational in the immediate years following uh, the completion of the, uh, the dollars that we're going to talk about here at Little Era. Next. So I mentioned the history a little bit there. Um, DO in 2006 got it paved. Um, that was, uh, you know, phase one and two of that project. Phase three was the intersection of Empire Way and the services that went into those lots. Um, that was an investment of about half a million dollars, some locally, most provincial. Um, sort of languished a little bit um, with the departure of. Frankly, Glenn Manzik, who's the real driver of the airport project. Um, in 2011, uh, Glenn Harris, a, a local property developer, and uh, Tom McHale, who's a seasonal resident here and, uh, and has a airport consulting business uh, that works across Canada, um, started thinking about how, how we could move this project forward since there was some pretty significant dollars spent on it already. Um, and uh, the, the first thing they did was commissioned primarily by Jim Stone, Tom's company, along with the OIB uh, town and some local stakeholders was to commission this uh, engineering report. And, and the, the basic result of that report was that we have an excellent location for an airport here, um, as compared to say, Cassegar, has anybody ever flown into Cassegar? Um, did you then? Did you not? Yeah, so it's like a 50 50 compared to another yeah. good example of a 40 located airport. Um, and there was some Palm Springs, it's a 40 located airport, um, where on an instrument approach, meaning you're in cloud approaching the airport, uh, it's nice not to have hills around. Um, we do have hills around, but it's a very wide base, and then the airport's located at an elevation that actually favors getting very low on approach, meaning you can successfully land. Uh, that's not always the case in British Columbia. In fact, in most cases, airports in the Caribou, for example, are usually built on river delta where fog forms, that kind of thing. So, yeah, just to say that the report had fantastic results. Uh, next slide. Um, so, in 2014, the Associated Airport Development Society was officially uh, formed with those uh, people, initially Dan Thomas and uh, uh, Jason Burks, local stakeholder. Um, one of the first applications we made uh, became aware of through the Associated Credit Union's community giving in 2017. Um, went towards uh, it was nearly twenty seven thousand dollars and went towards a sort of master plan, a strategic plan, and our opportunity assessment for the airport. Um, thereafter, twenty seventeen, uh, through the BCR access program, uh, there was an eighty thousand uh, dollar grant. It was a seventy five twenty five match, eighty thousand was the total spend. It went to the first phase of the fencing. Uh, the twenty thousand of that came from the town. Uh, again, it's, it's the same funny partners. It's always the band, the town, local stakeholders, members of those. Uh, in 2018, uh, the Ministry of Environment requested that a QEP um, be retained before any further work was done, which we did. Next one. So, yeah, there's the participants in the uh, uh, BCR access program. You can see the yellow portion is what was fenced under that grant. Next one. And then the excitement started. Uh, we became aware, I'm trying to remember who made us aware of it. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Economic Recovery and Infrastructure Program, CIRA, <laughs> about which was made in uh, 2020. We were awarded that just over a year ago. Um, the, uh, you can go to the next slide. The dollars were uh, 524, 174. That was specific to the dollar amount that was asked for uh, with a, uh, 
um, some seed money that, that came from outside of this grant, um, which we'll see in the next slide. Yeah. So, I don't know, yeah. um, so uh, the Osoyoos Airport Development Society was retained as the project manager to see the uh, oversee the the uh, the projects that that uh, were funded through Syrup, and that was primarily uh, expanded airport taxiway runway, field tie downs, and and messing up. Fencing. 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 <laughs> the voice just came out of nowhere. Um, uh, yeah, next slide, please. Uh, we retain true consulting. Um, the role is to oversee the tendering process for design design projects. Um, and here are the aforementioned projects here. The first, the airport taxiway and runway expansion have been completed. Has everybody seen those since they've been done? Gorgeous black asphalt. Um, second project is perimeter fencing. It is complete. Uh, the third project, tie downs, have been tendered and awarded, and uh, work has begun. The fourth, uh, fuel has been tendered, not awarded, and we'll put a pin in that and come back to it. Um, and to assist in the funding of these projects, the, the town's portion of that seed money was $10,000. Excellent. So here you see the, uh, this is really a notional master plan of what we can see at the airport. I said there's an evolution to airports, and this is what you could expect to see in the very long term. We've completed the dark gray portion immediately to the right of the green, what would be future tie downs there some of the airport ex uh, runway expansion and we'll see this in the next slide you can see the there's a blue taxiway there that crosses over the runway to the east and then butts up to the new threshold um, from the east side uh, a very small portion of that's been done but that's how we could then uh once in the, in the future perhaps have uh, more uh, safe secure and uh, easy movement of aircraft around in the airport facility um, the blue that you see on the west side of the airport there to the bottom of the runway uh, would be tie downs, hangars, aviation related businesses, the things that you see pop up at airports. Uh, the best example I can think of this would be Vernon. Uh, anybody's been up to the airport, it started out just like I said, as a dirt and grass and paved, and, and now it's a thriving uh, driver um, of the economy in Vernon. There's uh, aviation related businesses, sky, skydiving schools, uh, maintenance and overhaul, that kind of thing. Um, all right, next slide. And there you see our beautiful black uh, asphalt. So there's the taxiway. You can see, I don't think you can see that's pretty pretty small print. The extended runway, the apron, uh, fencing is obviously hard to see here. Next slide. Has everybody got a copy of our spending thus far? This is part of the report that went to the zero folks of uh, our budget and actuals to date. Um, Nope. We'll make sure you get one. Uh, we'll put a pin in this as well. Maybe save it for the FAQ or the uh, question period at the end if you like. Next slide. So, pending activities, what comes next? Um, we looked at the expanded taxiway there that goes south and east. We looked at possible locations of hangars and tie downs. Those unfortunately impinge on a uh, road. Uh, dedication that the province has to service or access some lots. You can see the pink there that goes around the south side of the airport and some lots on the southeast side of the of the property. Um, that's with the province right now. Um, slower than we like. Uh, there was uh, a motion passed by the previous council to um, make that application to apply for relief of the province and it's, it's with that. There's some challenges. There's some challenges. Yeah. 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 It's a long conversation. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. It's it's pretty quick actually we don't have uh a right of way over those lands where our trail is so it kind of is stuck they're working on they're working on yeah yeah so we could look at the previous slide at, at another time but if, if you did have and you have all have access to this but if, if you look at where that road crosses over all those projected uh, sites for, for tie downs. It, it impinges on everyone just a little bit. It's, is it a deal breaker? No, but it sure would be nice to have it done. Uh, uh, next slide. Yeah, see there's the lots going on the southeast side. Next one. Yeah. So that's where we're at today. Uh, the main reason that we're here uh, presenting other than just bringing up the speed. Um, let me say hello to our new counselors. 
Thanks for serving. Um, is that second vote point, the Sierra Grant? Um, we would like to make an amendment to the grant to defer the fuel project. I mentioned earlier that it's been tendered but not awarded. We had some preliminary quotes well before we made the application, so we could assign some dollars to the application amount. Typical stuff, COVID supply chain, it is way up. And the ROI on that investment in terms of taking this huge chunk of money that we would now have to devote to putting fuel services in, which by the way, would then require ongoing operational fees that have come from somebody, um, would not pay for themselves immediately. It doesn't make a lot of sense to uh, spend those dollars the way that we plan. It makes much more sense to continue to expand the airport to the runway to the south. Or some other thing like paving some of the tie downs, but the fuel not a lot of sense. Um, we expect that the folks at Syrup will be quite favorable to the amendment. They've been very easy to work with. Um, wanted to come and make this presentation to the folks first, um, get your blessing before we make that ask for them to make the change order. Um, so I'll leave that with you. The other thing, uh, the first bullet point there, the governance model. This has sort of been notionally spoken about when we entered into the management agreement with town, um, between town and the Soy Surf Development Society, um, to manage the airport after these projects. Uh, typically, that's what you see at an airport the size of a group of volunteers, like the other volunteers we've seen here this morning, um, is that uh, somebody has to field inquiries from prospective tenants, uh, businesses. Uh, work with contractors, uh, you know the drill. Uh, the existing management agreement uh, over the you know imp imp implementation of the syrup funds and spending of syrup funds was uh, it's going to come to an end in about a year. And even for that, we should probably start digging down, drilling down on a governance model. We have we've been getting a lot of inquiries uh, for people who want to bring their little airplane here. But, Three probably serious inquiries for businesses that want to be located here. Um, and we don't want to let those languages too long to go elsewhere. I've seen that movie before. Um, next slide. I think it's going to be all of it. Um, sorry for the lengthy presentation for those of you that's heard before. Um, any questions? Thank you very much, Bob. Yeah. It's always good to get a refresher on what's happened over the years because uh, there's been a, a lot of things that have had to be dealt with. And uh, I think our new Patrick on Luca is the new member on the, on the yeah on the board uh, yeah. instead of Councillor Harvey who has moved. Oh. Uh, yeah. And uh, so he he's the one that he would contact through the town if he were needing to have a meeting. Um, I'm just I'm wondering if um, Ms. McKay has anything to add or or our CAO? Um, we're still looking at it. Yeah. yeah. Um, she's in there. Um, my suggestion might be that council request staff to bring back our report. And I would suggest that you'd be looking for a resolution from council to support an amendment to the terms for the uh, SERP grant that the um, Odes could then approach uh, the province with, and possibly uh, some more information on uh, the possibility of the extension of the runway to the south, and or other works that might be able to be performed in advance of that, because that's going to still be a couple years out. Um, so there might be more value in the pavement of the tie down areas, for example, and then possibly some options around what uh draft management agreement might look like but that i'm turning towards the co for confirmation that that would be a direction we want to go does that make sense um uh, mr yeah. it's working bob yeah I, I, sure. so mr uh, council yeah, i just want to mention i don't know if you made note earlier about the economic trust of the southern interior you would definitely fit into that trust and i believe there's two intakes a year up to a hundred thousand each we will, we will definitely be here. Yeah, thank you. Councilman Bennett. Thank you, Mayor McCarr. Uh, just on a lighter side, um, <clears throat> I'm sorry to hear Mr. Harris is sick, and I see in the picture he's got a couple balls of good 
I always support. I also. I always support uh, BC made wines. Uh, those, are, those, those are big note to Benes. Yeah. 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 Do you have any comments? Do you have anything you'd like to add, uh, Mr. Harris? Well, just uh, I, I apologize again that I, I'm not there. I'm not feeling too badly. Uh, as Rob mentioned, I, I was in, I, I held out for a long, long time, but I finally succumbed to COVID. Someone in our family brought it into the house, and, and I was uh, I unfortunately picked it up. But it was it was kind of last Thursday, so I'm I'm past my kind of five days of isolation. I might venture out tomorrow. Uh, other than a a little bit of a stuffy nose and a head cold. I'm, 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 I'm doing fine, but I just didn't think it was appropriate to, to travel and to, to be there. But uh, I'm happy that there was an opportunity to join you by, by Zoom and uh, certainly welcome both new councillors to the table and look forward to working with, uh, with Zach and the rest of uh, our ODES team and, and, and the town to move the project further. Good, thank you very much. We hope thank that you're doing better soon. Thank you. So, Council, is any, would anyone like to make a motion that we request a staff report to look at all of the issues um, concerning uh, this particular, um, the, the airport society? Okay, that would be Councillor Chung is moving that we ask for a staff report with all of the issues brought forward. Is there a seconder? Councillor Bennett is seconding that. All in favor? Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. And we will get back to you once we have sorted out what happens here. All right. All right we're good. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much, Mr. Harris. Bye bye. Um, now. Cheers. Do we not have the Chamber of Commerce? Yes, we do. They magically appear when we offer. Oh, he was hanging in the lobby. Okay, so guess what? You're up next. <laughs> so we're happy to have the South Okanagan Chamber of Commerce, and I believe that um, that the director, Denise Blanco, is going to present. Brian, our Brian. Brian. Well, Brian and I spent some time yesterday on the community walk, so I've got to know him. Brian is the president of the of the chamber. So welcome, Brian. Uh, as you said, I am Ryan Duffy, and uh, I would love to uh, have Denise uh, do this for us. But uh, it's, it's nice once in a while if the uh, board members actually get out to council and meet everybody. So um, we're very pleased to be here uh, to present on behalf of the uh, South Oakland Chamber of Commerce. And first and foremost, we would like to congratulate all of the councillors and the mayor on their successful elections. <clears throat> Excuse me. We wanted today to bring you a bit of a report on the, uh, the Chamber of Commerce and what we've done, our accomplishments throughout 2022, and what we're looking forward to doing in 2023. For starters, um, if any of you uh, are not already connected with the Chamber of Commerce, uh, we invite you to uh, speak to Denise, our uh, managing director. She would love to add you to our communications and make sure that you're fully in tune to what's going on with the Chamber of Commerce. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, we ourselves, <clears throat> we have rebuilt our small and mighty Chamber of Commerce, and we are proud of the work that we have been doing within each of our communities. We were able to bring $100,000 to our community and hire several contractors to help with business retention, recovery uh, over the last 18 months through the province and at CBC. We feel that the business community and economic development in our region requires the diverse type of regular ongoing efforts and funding for the greater success of our towns, for the betterment of our businesses and our residents. It's no surprise that funding allowed us to amplify our regular chamber efforts and provide regular and ongoing business outreach in the business community in the soils. We provided support to various, um, <clears throat> excuse me, to a variety of areas sharing resources, marketing training, referrals, 
This is coaching just to name a few. A few other recent accomplishments from the chamber were uh, bringing a very successful virtual leadership training opportunity through BC Chamber to our businesses and nonprofit community. The first round was so successful that the BC Chamber added an additional two intakes and we had participants in each of the uh, sessions from our communities in South Oak Mountain. We're part of a federally funded support local initiative through BC Chamber that brought several thousands of dollars into our region and shared among our local radio, newspapers, small business, nonprofit, and schools. Okanagan, we've got this, which was a collaboration of chamber, uh, <laughs> excuse me, chambers from Vernon all the way to the Soyuz. We created an Explore Next Door campaign, which was shared extensively throughout the Okanagan. A video was created with local Soyuz film company, uh, Blade Nine Films, that highlighted several businesses and activities throughout our region, including Soyuz spotlights at Smitty's, Double O Bikes, Okanagan Art Gallery, and the Soyuz uh, Bike Trail. Again, bringing several thousand of dollars into the region just, create, just through the creation of the videos. The South Okanagan stories have had over, uh, sorry, the South Okanagan stories, we've had over 30 professional written stories that have been filmed and highlighted in, in our, um, our communications, our websites, our YouTube channels, um, highlighting the benefits of business and life in the South Okanagan. Recently, as you know, um, and many of you have been invited and will participate in our business walks, something that we had to step away from over the last couple of years due to the pandemic, but we're fully engaged again in each of our communities. The amazing efforts to re-engage with our communities, with our business owners, our managers, to ensure the, uh, the, con the continued success of these businesses is paramount for the chamber. We are currently working on a video series that will feature different industry clusters in the South Okanagan, um, <clears throat> such as agriculture, manufacturing to start, and hoping to move into more uh, in the near future with health, wellness, and uh, the, the focus of the community. There are just a couple of highlights, um, but I would like to show <clears throat> that I would like to show uh, how the Chamber of Commerce has been successful. Our Etsy contract, uh, Etsy BC contract, wraps up in mid December, and we're working diligently to uh, complete our inputs for uh, the uh, 2022 uh, year and look at the strategies for the coming future in 2023. Some of you know, we have recently applied for the uh, October intake for FCBC um, and for a formal business retention, expansion and relocation program here in the South Okanagan. And we thank you for your letter of support uh, that you provided to us in September. Since then, we upgraded our application to the higher category in hopes that we don't lose any momentum or connection that we've made in the last couple of years. The grant application that we upgraded to requires matching funds within our communities. This will allow us the opportunity to work diligently on behalf of our communities and our business owners. We had two asks um, that we wanted to put forward today of council. The first being that we would like to uh, we would like to have formal engagement via a liaison with the Chamber of Commerce that would participate uh, with the board and be a liaison be a liaison between council, town staff, and the Chamber of Commerce. The formal ask is that they be uh, able to attend one in-person uh, chamber meeting and minimum two virtual meetings to have a, sort of a pulse on what's going on with the chamber and be fully involved. 
Uh, the second request is with the grant applications, uh, we will be presenting or we would like to present to Council a formal uh, presentation of uh, all of the initiatives that will be encompassed in the grant um, and what we're looking to or what we uh, anticipate uh, being able to do with the funds if we're successful. So the second ask is uh, it's an opportunity um, that doesn't come very often and we would ask um, and we would like to request that we're able to work closely with the town staff to facilitate uh, a presentation on the needs of our community. Uh, another opportunity that we would like to discuss uh, with staff is the Rural Economic Diversification Infrastructure Program uh, that was announced last week by the government. This is the project uh, and plan uh, for the implementation, sorry, the implementation um, in the communities, and it's open to uh, communities less than 25,000 people, and the maximum funding uh, is up to a million dollars. The deadline for this application is January 4th, and we do plan um, to uh, vigorously go after any of the funding that we can achieve that's going to help the betterment of each of our communities with respect to uh, business retention, recovery, and relocation. Our focus isn't on um, the tourism aspect. Dio um, does a great job of that, and we don't want to uh, go in their lane. Um, we want to stay in our lane, and we think the, the best use for our time, our efforts, our expertise, is uh, business uh, recovery, retention, and relocation. Um, I would like to uh, end with a final note that we have uh, engaged an individual that has agreed at a higher level to participate with the Chamber of Commerce on a consulting basis in an ECDEV uh, capacity. So um, it's not just uh, our mighty little chamber, but we are looking outside of the walls of our chamber to uh, get the support that we need. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, it's, it's great to have sort of the explanation of what you do. And and I knew that, um, that, that the chamber always supported the businesses that were in town. And to me, in my mind, the economic development was to try and support new businesses that were needed or um, so working together. I know you've already met with some of our staff mm -hmm. um, and I'm glad that you have been really involved with SEBC. Um, it goes, it, I mean, it's amazing. It goes from Blue River to Hope down to the border and over to the, to the uh, Alberta border. So it's a huge, huge area. Um, and um, and SEBC used to just, well, they used to give out lots of loans, which were quite difficult to manage. And so they're out of that business now and just giving grants. So um, we're happy that you've had the counselors that were, and I remember hearing um, Denise talk about it, counselors that were helping businesses with recovery and so on. Um, you're doing a great job. So thank you very much. Is there any, is there any questions? Go ahead. I have one question. <laughs> is the town a member of the chamber? Yes. Yeah. You're at the growth membership level. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Have you seen an increase in, in membership? So I, I can give you the membership breakdown oh, right now for the South Oak Garden Chamber. So we have a total of 230 members. We have 100 in Oliver. We have 80 in the Soyuz, 20 in Oak Bay Falls, and 30 in the RDOS. Good. Wow. Good. Thank you very much. And go ahead, Councillor Bennett. Thank you, Madam Mayor. <clears throat> um, first of all, uh, Ryan, I, I went on that walk yesterday with the uh, uh, with your vice president and uh, talked to downtown businessmen. When you said re engage, I think that's a great word because we walk down Main Street and talk to different business. I won't get into Denise's report this yeah. week, after this, but <clears throat> I think re engage was people were just excited that the chamber's there and the council's there, that people are there just asking how they're doing, 
how you get over it. So a lot of people are kind of like, well, we were doing so good and we wanted like to hear them. We were so busy. Now slow down is kind of stop and we're not sure. Right. They're kind of like, yo, great. So it was a really good learning experience. And so I think that's mm -hmm. a great thing they're doing because they're really getting to re-engage. Thank you. And I have been involved with Chamber for quite a few years and, and I'd be willing to volunteer for that position if nobody else wants it. Thank you, Councillor Bennett. That may, I, I wondered if you and Councillor King, who've been so involved for so long, might be the yeah, right people to. Oh, has he? Oh, okay. He told <laughs> you that that was your job. Okay. We will deal with that. And yes, go ahead. My, my name would have to ring yeah. as well. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> it will, it will come up to uh, 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 a staff will bring a report back. Mm -hmm. yeah, for sure. There's nothing that we would love more than to be fought over who gets <laughs> <laughs> no, no. So, you know what? We, uh, we would welcome the participation of any and all uh, members of council um, and our door is always open and we would uh, we would love to have any of you participate this year. Thank you very much. And Ryan and I did one side of the street yesterday and uh, Myers and, and Carrie did the other side and we had the same concern. We got in, we didn't get a lot of businesses that, I mean, after three hours or so we were kind of done, but several of them really wanted to talk to us and they were quite happy that we had come in and we heard their life story in many, pla in many yeah, places in many places of people and, and the concern. So it's a very worthwhile yeah. endeavor that that uh, that has been done. And I know it hasn't been for a couple of years. So I'm glad it's back on track. I think just to add to that, it, it's not just the interactions that each of us made um, in the walks. It's how it resonates afterwards uh, with their fellow business people and the, um, the buzz that it creates. Yeah, great. Well, thank you very much thank to you. the chamber for um, for that presentation. We thank appreciate you. it. Thank appreciate you. Appreciate it. <clears throat> okay. Last but not least, we have the Masuya Golf Club, and uh, and Doug Rob, the general manager, is here. So welcome, folks. Thanks for having us. Uh, in 2019, our two last that was before the national meeting of that time. Yes. So Brenda Hendrickson as company and she's our vice president. Well, Just on the board, um, I'm engaged with the board a lot. They do a lot of work. It's like a lot of the volunteer position, but it really isn't. They're full-time <laughs> people there. They just don't get paid for it. Um, so um, just to give you an overview on where we are uh, post-2019, post-COVID, these are all great pictures to look at in the wintertime. <laughs> so, um, I thought I'd bring those along. Um, so obviously COVID hit a lot of businesses hard um, and uh, uh, we suspected it would be the same with the golf club, especially early days. Um, but as we worked our way through it and people were able to travel, uh, that was really not the case. And the um, industry um, has had a real boom in the last three, three seasons, believe it or not. So um, we were able to grab that trend with everyone else. So um, we've had a record number of rounds over the last three seasons, uh, that being member rounds or, or guest rounds. Um, our guest round numbers up 15 to 20 percent. So we're doing about 25,000 guest rounds a year, which is a large number of rounds. I mean, we've done, since COVID hit, we've done 200,000 rounds of golf at the Swiss Golf Club. Um, and that's with 25 percent less staff than I really need or should have. Um, when we're fully operational, we're around 80, 80 staff members. So I, I think we're the largest in town. We're pretty close. A lot of our challenge is bringing in new people, especially senior people or uh, people for food and beverage has been has been accommodation. Um, so we are actively on the search for that for, for 2023. Um, I like to tell all my counterparts in the industry, there's really not, there's no off in season. Um, we are working diligently for 2023 to cover off areas that we need to uh, take care of. So the other thing that's happened to us, which has happened to all businesses, our fixed costs have gone up. Um, fuel, fertilizer, labor, all that stuff has kind of gone through the roof. We're experiencing that with our irrigation project. So we can go to the next slide. Um, so that, that, has been, that has been a challenge for us. Um, as you know, we have 
we have come to the town. We have talked about our irrigation system upgrade. Um, it is a generational upgrade that we are currently in the midst of. We started that project in 2000, in October this season. Um, interesting stats. So in peak season, we're pumping about 1.25 million gallons of water a day. So it's about 10 million gallons a week that we're putting on the property. So um, there's a lot of things going on with irrigation. Um, the facility that we're currently doing is the Park Meadows, so it's about 50 years old at Hall Club. So that particular property, so that is the irrigation that we're currently working on. Um, so for us to have a, a major um, irrigation situation and temperatures of 35 to 40 degrees, we're going to lose the property, right? So it's a is it's, for us, it's a necessity, not a luxury. So we move forward with that project in October. Um, we had talked to the town in 2019, um, and we had talked about, um, in, during that time, we had applied for a grant and COVID hit. All the grants kind of were dried up, so we didn't see any grant money. We did apply, um, we did not get that. So we came to the town, the town had talked about a $300,000 commitment, which was tied to the um, grant, which obviously we did not get. So we did have, we never had a choice. We had to move forward with the project just due to necessity and age of the current irrigation system. So uh, we've gone to the bank and go to the next slide now. Yeah. We approached the bank, so um, we secured $2 million, um, which we are currently in the midst of spending. And um, as we all know, everything just costs are spiraling. So we're trying to keep, obviously, I have a, a contractor and myself that work daily on that project to make sure that we are staying the course. I mean, it's just anything that you're dealing with now, just trying to get product or purchasing product, especially with those kind of um, systems can be expensive. So we're trying to stay the course, make sure we get in on the number. Um, the golf club uh, cannot afford any more uh, situation with long-term debt. So basically we have the clubhouse and we have this irrigation project. Um, and this irrigation project, will be, our plan is to pay it off in 10 years. Um, we just did not add it to the mortgage. For example, we gone and got a business loan and it's a good, we made a business case. We went to the membership, we got approval to spend the money. So, um, you know, it's a huge project for us to take on. And it's the number one risk factor. So that's the reason we are doing it. Um, let me go to the next slide. Okay. So, I uh, just go back just for a second. So just, just a quick update. So with this project, we can work through the winter. We got shut down with a cold snap that hit us about three weeks ago. Uh, we are back up and operational there to get as much of the project done as we can in the fall. So in the spring, we're hopefully we're just bucking up. Um, it can be a disruption. So um, that's what we're attempting to do now. We'll work as deep into the winter as we can. So in the spring, we hope we, you know, hopefully we can open with not too much disruption. So you can go to the next slide, please. And that's just an area of what um, you see. Um, it's pretty interesting. We have the ponds there, and then we have the, the property around it. Um, we have the opposite problem with most facilities. Most facilities are looking for water. We we got a lot of water. <laughs> We're pumping a lot of water. So we have different challenges that we deal with because of that salt content and water and all that other stuff. But um, it is a challenge for us. Um, we are we look at ourselves as partners of the town for sure, um, as far as the amount of water that we're pumping, um, and uh, you know we like to continue our relationship, try to build on that. Um, the club is an integral part of the community. We're driving, we think a lot of revenue through with accommodators, um, especially in June and September when a lot of the holiday people have gone. Um, those are our two biggest group months, so we're you know, driving a lot of people through the facility. So that gives you a brief overview of what our challenges have been since COVID hit um, and um, where we currently sit. Well, thank you very much for uh, presenting that. We certainly understand the concern about the 300000 of course, it's hard to, to come by, and, uh, and grants are not always available, but um, we're busy applying for every grant that we can, so and I know that, that you will too. Um, the 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 fact that you have gone to the bank for a business loan, I think, is really positive, and I think 
you're to be commended for taking that um, taking that step. Um, I know that the salt and the water softeners is a huge concern. Um, I always try to buy the so the potassium, I think it's better than the sodium. <laughs> Whenever I put it in my water softener, because I think it's better for the, the environment. I could be wrong, but that's what I was told. It's certainly a lot more expensive, so I'm hoping it's worth better. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, I'm going to open it up and see if anybody from the council has any questions about this. Go ahead, Councillor. Yeah, David. thank you, Member. First of all, thanks for the presentation and the update. Uh, I don't know if you heard earlier about that economic trust. Um, <laughs> there's funding there. Is there an opportunity to get a copy of financials? Yeah. Was it a hard sell with all the volunteers on board to actually put their names on a loan for $2 million? Actually, no. I mean, the, the support for the members has been exceptional because they recognize that. So this has kind of been in play for about 10 years. Okay. We just didn't have, we just weren't in a position to be able to do that, right? Okay. Um, and the success of the last three seasons has, has put us in a position to be able to go to the bank. So so we, well, you know, we had, to, we had to get skin with things. We put a half a million dollars down uh, to get this loan, right? So um, We've dealt with a lot of things at the club over the last three or four years that have been pushed back just because of where we where the cash was. You no know, equipment upgrades. We had a mm -hmm. deck issue to deal with. That was a half a million dollar play. So you know we've done a lot of things over the last couple of seasons to ensure the you know the sustainability of the properties. You know can become like an old car if you're not paying attention to it, right? So like the building's 25 years old now, and so those kind of things things creep in where it becomes mm -hmm. big capital expenditures. But you don't always budget for it. You can budget dogs because everyone knows you can budget for certain things, but you can't budget for everything, right? So, and we have, you know, we can only charge people so much to play that, right? So we have to keep that in mind, obviously. So that's what we tend to do. Um, the board's very fiscally responsible. We got a great group of people here. So I'm trying to drive the property forward. One other comment. I don't know if you have some people come to town with trailers. Have you ever talked to Desert Park about using their facilities? For some of your golfers that are across the street where they can park for the weekend at a reasonable price and then play golf. Yeah, some of them go in there. We, the majority of our for pay for place, I guess, are coming from the mainland or Vancouver. So okay. Um it's been like yeah. Wherever we can find a spot, I would see people kind of parked everywhere on the way to work. But <laughs> <laughs> well, we know from especially women, this has been told to me several times that um that women like to come to Wasuyas uh, in in groups. They go to home hardware and they go golfing, and uh, and that's and so we get lots of people that that end up going to the golf course and going to home hardware. Interesting, isn't it? But wineries, I think, is probably yeah, third on the list. But <laughs> so you know that the that destination Wasuyas gave us a report recently and said that during the COVID. Um, years that uh, that the rest of the country was um, was having a difficult time dealing with things. The South Okanagan and Asuias in particular did was did way better than anywhere else in Canada, and um, and so I think that that is a combination of of volunteers and um, and businesses that were ready to take on the next step and uh you know what that's to everybody's credit and in here and uh we just we thank you very much for providing a great service to, yeah. uh, we, to the our visitors and our locals because there's lots of locals that do that too um did so you did you have an ask today or just you were just sort of giving us the well we're all, yeah i'm mean, always an ask yeah exactly i mean i'm yeah, I've, I've talked a lot of this. Yeah, talked previous to this. So, you know, we're just, we, we, we try to like get back into play for the 300K if that's on the table. I mean, because part of this irrigation project, the one thing you have to remember is it, it, it's not including the pump house. So the pump house is separate. So the pump house is 1982. So that's where, you know, that's where, that's where we're pushing the water with the pumps, right? And the, yes. the pump costs have basically doubled in the last few years, right? Yeah. So, you know, that's going to be a, an added cost to us, and we'll need to deal with it in the next 12 months. So, um, 
So I know that you've had some meetings with our CAO and uh, he understands the situation and we're certainly looking at, um, at budget issues in the next month or so. Um, I think we have quite a few things on the agenda that we need to that we need to look at. But uh, Which I appreciate. I'm just, yeah, sure. Just we totally understand. And thank yeah. you very much for presenting yeah, um, this to us because we need to know all of those things. All right. So thank you. Thank all you. Right. Yeah. Appreciate it. <laughs> Me, I'm going. If you go on at CBC. On the website, there's a ton of information on there. Go on there and have a look. Okay. Have a, thank you. Okay, next um, we have the uh, staff report, strategic priority. And that would be um, Thank you, Your Worship. This, uh, this report is about the people around this table and, and the future of our community. And, it's important for council to identify their priorities so that uh, administration is on the same page. It also gives us the ability to plan for uh, some of the priorities that you have. And so, what we put in the agenda and attached to this report is um, is the, uh, highlighting the objectives and priorities that uh, some of you have talked about. And I think what's important here is. Um, you know, it's kind of a nice one pager that outlines what your priorities are, and also towards the bottom of the page indicates the steps that the administration is doing to meet some of these objectives. Plus, it also provides some uh, additional projects that the administration is working on. So, it's basically kind of a communication tool between administration and council. Um, what we're hoping to occur is some additional dialogue on these priorities and ultimately proceeding to council. And the next council meeting for, for approval. And what's also important for the public to understand is, you know, there are limited resources. Uh, there's a lot of projects that uh, people around this table want, as well as uh, uh, the residents and businesses, but there's only so much capacity. And so what this basically does is places, um, there's a list of priorities here, about uh, I think it's around 15 or 16 priorities, but we're going to focus on probably the top five. So what this does is it illustrates what administration is working on, but also provides, uh, I guess, a transparency on what is on council's mind and what the next priority is, is going to be. Administration hopes to, uh, what, once this is passed, is to bring forward a report quarterly to council to give uh, an update on where things are at. I mean, reports may come prior to that on certain decision making pieces, but at least once a quarter, come back to council, show us, show you where we're at on each of the projects. And council always does have the ability to adjust priorities. Um, and so that always lies with, with council and, and where you want to see your priorities. But uh, say having something that's that's written, documented, and transparent is I think better for uh, all of us to be sure that we're going in the same direction. So I open up the council to see if uh, the priorities chart is resonates and is uh, reflects uh, the uh, wishes of council. So it looks to me like it's um, a kind of an overview of what we did with Gordon McIntosh, right? And uh, those are all of the things that I think we talked about. So it's nice to have it sort of on one piece of paper for sure. Dr. Bennett. Thank you, Madam Mayor. <clears throat> uh, well, I, I, I think this is great because I'm, there's things that all of a sudden, two years have gone by, and all of a sudden, you know, oh, that was two years ago already. So we've had things on the books that you think, okay, we're working on them. And then all of a sudden, you don't realize that two or three years have gone by and you haven't done with them. And then you kind of go, ooh, this is kind of late. So I think this will keep us more on focus. Anybody else? No? Any questions? All right. Well, Thank you very much for doing this. I think we need to keep a copy of this. I'd like to put this on the wall in my office and uh, because it's quite helpful, isn't it, to, to have that just to check back. So, so you, Your Worship, if yes. uh, the whole, uh, see this captured the, the comments of, of council, uh, we'll proceed to a council meeting to get formal approval on uh, the priorities and uh, that's 
we'll start receiving a quarterly update in 2023. So, um, yeah, so you don't need a motion to to do that. Is this is this is all going automatic? Okay, great. Thank you very much. So, um, is there anything else on the agenda today? Not until two o'clock. <laughs> okay, so um, we have one last thing to do, and that would be to terminate the meeting. Councillor King, thank you. Is there a seconder, <laughs> Councillor Chong? Um, we, uh, I will take a vote on that. All in favor? Thank you very much, everybody. And, um,